there we go. Okay. Yeah, we all live. Um, good to see everyone here from the Marshall Islands. Um, I'm grateful to be a part of today's session. Um, the When Is Now campaign is something that I think it's really um, thoughtful and and like I, it's very thoughtful in, in connecting all of these poets into this issue and across cultures, across the globe and projecting this work into uh, public spaces. Um, I think poetry matters when we make it matter. So it's really beautiful to see the work of When Is Now and I've been really um, honored to be a part of that journey as the cultural ambassador. Um, I just want to introduce the new two poets who will be sharing their work today, who I'm really excited about. And um, I can't wait to hear them read. Um, so Yvonne Abbas is a naturalist, award-winning writer, educator, and activist based in Chennai, India. Apologies if I mispronounced Chennai. After moving out of conventional schooling at the age of 16, Yuvan pursued his self-education and cultivated a deep relationship with nature throughout life. He is the author of A Naturalist Journal uh, from Notion Press, published in 2017, a collection of essays. He is a recipient of the M, M, M. Krishnan Nature Writing Award conferred by the Madras Naturalist Society. He also teaches at an alternative education space for children in Chennai as he continues to reimagine an earth-centric and child-centric education in schools. He's a contributor to the When Is Now campaign and a frequent collaborator with the Agam Agenda. Malevo Supodi is a South African interdisciplinary scholar and artist whose debut nonfiction title Misbehave from Blackbird Books in 2017 won her the South African Literary Award for a first time published author. She is a doctoral candidate in information systems at the University of Cape Town. Her academic research interests include African feminism, the hegemony of science, human development policy, artificial intelligence, sustainable technology, and ICT for development. Her forthcoming creative work is a visual exploration of the relationship between embodiment and the land in South Africa. She is a contributor to the One Is Now campaign and a frequent collaborator with the Agam Agenda. Wow, such cool people. And uh, I'm really honored to get to know them through this space. And I'm looking forward to the conversation afterwards. But for now, um, I'm going to give it over to these poets to, to share their, write, their writing first. Maybe we can start with Yvonne. Yvonne. It's thank you, Kathy, for that. Um, it's just afternoon uh, where I am. Uh, Chennai is um, a city on the southeastern coast of India. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm excited to be here. And this poem I've written, uh, Growth with Goodness, um, is actually the tagline of one of the largest multinational companies uh, in the world, Adani. And the poems about a campaign, we are fighting against them. Um, a, a large, uh, recently somebody called it a monstrous port, uh, just south of India's second largest brackish water lagoon, Pulikat. And it threatens to trigger erosion of the lagoon and merge it with the Bay of Bengal, the ocean. And all the... Um, the land, the, the people there, the biodiversity there, which would vanish, uh, is something we are actively fighting against uh, right now. And this poem is about that. And a lot of words in this are in Tamil, um, the, the language we speak here. So, growth with goodness. Here by the drying silver biddies under the circling sea eagle, fisher children play a game with the ardy wind. Standing in a line, they drop spiky seed heads of spinifex grass downwind. Jumping, cheering, shouting, clapping, they watch their tumbleweeds race down the sand. When will they know that their home beach is to be erased from the maps? Their hamlets, sand dunes, flocks of stints like murmuring rain clouds, mother olive ridleys, mangroves, even the boundless kosastalayar. Invisible to the port builder. 
hole from beneath a thousand torn song lines is to reach here soon, drown this lagoon. Pulikat, Mundra, Mumbai, Talabira, Bailadila, Vilinyam, Hasdio, Kamuti, Gotta, Galilee Basin, the Great Barrier Reef. Growth with goodness, posh words for plunder. Thank you. So some of the words there uh, for Kasastalayar is the river, largest river which flows through Chennai. And a lot of place names, two lines of place names are all places where uh, the company has caused ecocide in the past or is causing right now. So I want to read two more poems from uh, written by co-poets. Uh, for the When Is Now project. Uh, the first one is, is this stunning poem by Daniel, uh, um, who's, who's from Russia. And, and it, it speaks of absence. It, it, it has a very meaningful ambiguity to it. And, it, and it's stayed with me uh, beyond the logical in a, in a very visceral sense. Yeah. So when is now? Do these bodies know their ways any longer? Do our ways remember our bodies? Do these voices still hold their breath? Here, in our shattering sanctuaries, a convergence of languages is finding its fluency. The broken blossom, the heavier wave, the wound too wide for a wound, the wound too wide for a wound. As grief engulfs the ritual, skies exhale calendars of ending. Place your palm on the stretched season. Listen, for attention is memory in motion, a rigor of returning against the havoc of stubborn silence. World, that is love, that is you. Bless what haunts into healing. Bless what haunts into healing. Yeah. And I want to read this poem written in the Philippines by Laurie uh, called Gone. And when I first re read it, I read it vertically. I didn't read the lines. I read it vertically. And um, this poem can be read in so many ways and, and it can be arranged radially. Uh, and I love the way it sounded on my tongue. Yeah. So, so Gone, gallivanting through Mother Earth's gala. Gauntlets worn over hands of blood, gargantuan consequence governing our future. Guardians of the galaxy failed to save the sea turtles. Gaunt men hunting for tomorrows and trees unrelenting. Gone are everyone who ever saw, who ever loved eagles. Ghosts are all the species and emotions are holograms. Gas fossil fuels are depleted gone with the Martians. Genes unavailable now imitate the skin of a crocodile. Gear up shields. Gear up, shields up. Don't expect to fish into our seas. What is your game plan when all the animals are gone? Yeah. Thank you. That was so good, Yvonne. Thank you so much. Um, I really love all of these different pieces and I love the explanation that you shared with us about your piece, especially. I love the idea of naming as remembering, you know, um, going through each line, uh, each of those place names and, and, and honoring them by naming them. And then these pieces from these two poets, um, the concept of, I love the stretch season, and all the alliteration in that third piece. Um, there's some really beautiful ideas there. Uh, growth with goodness, that's uh, such a concept. So thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, really beautiful reading. Um, so I think we should move on now to our, our next poet, um, Malibo, if you're ready to share your work. Um, 
it's a, it's a good morning here from South Africa. It's really chilly. Um, we are meant to be in autumn, but it's, it's as cold as winter. Um, thank you so much, Yuvan, um, for reading that. And thank you, Kathy, for the words that you have shared. I'm an empath and my emotions are right here. And I'm so teary, I'm gonna take off my glasses because they are misty. Um, that was really, really beautiful. Thank you. I'm going to read Native Nostalgia Prelude to the Now. And just a background, I am a nonfiction writer and um, fiction had always been, you know, fiction and poetry has always been something that I never thought I could be part of even as an artist. And, you know, when Padma um, asked me to contribute to When Is Now, this was my first exploration with poetry. And I'd love to announce that I have found home in poetry because I have written um, a second poem, which will also be published. So thank you so much for gifting me with this, the gift of words that I didn't think existed within me. Um, I'm, right, I'm reading Native Nostalgia Prelude to the Now. Um, it's dedicated to Cape Town, which we call the mother city in South Africa. And black people in South Africa have a really complicated relationship with Cape Town. Um, because of the legacy of colonialism and apartheid, which were apartheid was a system um, that was meant to really oppress, you know, um, the indigenous and the black people of South Africa and um, a very neoliberal legacy is left and the, the, the legacy is glaring in the way that it's affecting the people in the way that it's affecting the environment. But the call, the clarion call, is to remember, to RE slash member, to remember ourselves to these lands, to know that even though they were forcefully, we talk about forcefully, um, we were displaced, our ancestors were displaced. Um, for us is to remember the relationship that our ancestors had with the land and that we do not own it, but we should find ways to work with it again so that we can bring balance. When will we ever feel safe in the mother city's nest? Ning, ni, ni. I long for a time when harmony between humans and nature was not a utopian dream scattered by the patter of raindrops that threaten rooftops. The rain that is no longer euphony or lullaby to hush you to slumber. A storm is fast approaching. Stay on higher ground. Dig up trenches and unclog the drains. Wailing voices choking within the mother city echo code red, declare this a national emergency, belligerent tempest worn of a time to come. A treaty between the mortals and the natural environment is needed. Displaced, confused, we've become strangers to the mother city. Are you going to listen to the wind? Or are you going to wait for floating lilies to deliver seeds of condolences? Thank you. And now I am going to read a beautiful rendition text um, by Daniela Catrileo. And I chose this piece. I'm going to read it in its original text. I chose this piece because of exactly what when, in, when is now um, was doing with um, the collaboration in terms of bringing together artists, poets from across the globe, across borders um, to seed words. And so these words could sprout, you know, throughout and, you know, have one voice of collective action. And one of the things that we do when we write here, and, and, and I know a lot of countries do this, is when we write in our languages, the idea of trying to explain or translate first, um, you know, we think about what would happen if we just introduced ourselves in our languages. And this brings collaboration in terms of what language means for all of us and what it means for our cultures. And um, I remember as, I mean, in South Africa, we do not have 
Latin American languages and you know we, 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 we generally don't speak them or learn them. And so for me, reading this poem today in Spanish is from a place of love, um, just trying to be in this world. And um, I remember I was sharing it with my friends from across the globe for them to help me with the pronunciation, with the dialect. And it's interesting what that did. We started talking about you know, um, the environment. We started talking about what means, what's home to us. And, and, it, and it really did the work that it was meant to do. I was really drawn to this poem first because as I was meditating outside, a heron came to visit me. And that's the same day I was asked, which poem would you read? And water, bodies of water and the balance that water brings is very dear to my heart. My work explores water in different forms. So um, as I said, this reading comes from a, a deep place of love and wanting to connect with Daniela. Semillas que resisten. Cuando esta ramita de oceano volverá a escribir el brote de sus olas. Cuando el río Aconcoa retornará al buzo cotidiano de su viaje. Bajo la inmensa nube de calderas, una bandada de garzas blancas ensaya su vuelo. Observo la danza de sus plumajes diseminando esporas entre las aguas, semillas que resisten. Como un manojo de juros que se mencen ante la brisa, como un cúmulo de changuelas en sediarros que florecen en lo más alto del acantilado. I'm now going to read the English translation. Seeds that resist. When will the spring of ocean return to writing its budding waves? When will the Aconcoya River recover the pulse of its daily journey? Under the immense crater clouds, a flock of white herons rehearses flight. I watch their plumage dance, sowing spores into waters, seeds that resist, like a handful of seaweed that sways with the breeze, like rows of chacuelas, incendiary flowers that tower up there on the highest edge. And this poem was translated from the original Spanish by Helen Dixon. Thank you very much. Wow, that was so gorgeous. Thank you so much more for that reading, Malibu. And I love the intention behind this connection between the different languages and across the um, across countries. Uh, wow, there was so many things to take note of. I, I'm just like savoring the words and the images and the lines, like genuinely loving it. I really loved um, Remember Ourselves to These Lands. That was a line that stood out for me from your um, from what you were introducing, you know, and I think uh, something that also struck me was about how important it is that poets from our lands are the ones writing these pieces, you know, because then we have this relationship and this awareness that offers so much more nuance to what we're writing about. And there's a relationship there that we're cultivating and that we're kind of spotlighting in these pieces, you know, in, in these areas and in these locations that, you know, if I, if I didn't know you, if I wasn't a part of this project, I wouldn't know about these kinds of relationships and stories and places under threat. And I think that's kind of a really beautiful concept. You know, when we talk about the concept of climate change and global disaster, it's so easy to just see the whole world and not zoom in on, you know, a specific land, a specific river and how that's getting impacted and how much that matters, that specificity. I, I've been taught as a poet that specificity is what makes a poet, like the poem really powerful when you're as specific as possible. That, that was something that I always kind of took with me. 
So, you know, seeing these pieces that no one else could have written is like really inspiring for me. I also loved your call to action, Malibu, about, you know, are you going to listen to the wind uh, and the the lily pads of like, oh, I was like, oh, that's so good. And then definitely really enjoyed that translation, you know, seeing it in Spanish and then sort of wondering, I, I couldn't, I couldn't understand that much of it. I'm not a Spanish speaker either, but then that translation of when will this ocean return to writing its waves? I was like, oh, the ocean is writing. That's such a beautiful line. Gorgeous. Um, so uh, I, I think um, Padma, you wanted to, were, was there a question that you were going to ask me or do you want us to just move into conversation as uh, us three poets? Kathy, my question was really simple to start the conversation, oh. which was um, maybe just for you to share with Malebo and Yuvan and all the listeners a little bit about the situation, what sort of futures um, are people in the Marshall Islands looking to, and how does all that intersect with your work as a poet as well? And then I'll bow out and happily listen to the three of you. Exchange yeah things. okay great that's perfect um padma actually now i'm just remembering <laughs> but i was just saying that um actually it's really applicable what, what what i was just saying about the importance of you know of any landmark of any kind of um of no matter how small and i you know i, I can really say that as um someone who comes from a really small island you know um marshall islands is only two meters above sea level um, we're one of the few coral atoll nations in the world, like entirely atolls. So that means there's no mountains. There's nowhere to go if there's a higher, there's no higher ground, basically, um, with the rising sea level. So um, in my capacity as climate envoy, I've been working with our national government to develop uh, our national adaptation plan. And it's really complicated because we have a really deep cultural ties to our land. And so that cultural tie um, in, in, in enca encapsulates, like takes on um, land tenure system. You know, everyone owns a piece of land and everyone had, there's like a story behind every coral shelf. There's a story behind that grove of pandanus trees or a chant or a song. And what happens if we are forced to change those landscapes? What happens to those stories? And so these are kinds of the, um, and then also what happens to the landowners, you know? Um, and so these are, we're actually really considering very extreme solutions right now. Um, uh, elevating land, building islands, relocating within islands, um, because there's at least like 24 atolls right now. And each of them has their own kind of very unique um, biodiversity. And then they also have their own it's their own island like the like people here don't say i'm from the marshall islands when we meet one another we say i'm from anywhere like i'm from our you know you say the different island you're from so that makes it even more complicated who moves who has to move first how do we move them where do they move to um and so these are things that uh, we've been dealing with in the marshall islands and I, i've been trying to write as much as i can about these kinds of things that we're 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 processing. So um, yeah, so that's basically it. So um, I think that uh, that's why poetry, I think, has a really important role in capturing some of these stories, and in um, and in the work that we do in climate in these climate spaces. So I guess I'll I'll just go into the question now. Um, I, maybe I'll add this as a question for you both. Uh, just asking if you can maybe tell us a bit more about the poem you wrote um, that you just shared. If you want to add more context to your piece or if you feel like you covered it already, that's also fine. So up to you both. Uh, maybe Malebo, you, do you want to start since you just shared your piece? Yeah, thank you about that. So I actually have to bring my poem up. Give me a second. Can just see it. So yeah, so it 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 was really about, as I said, um, we have a complicated relationship with Cape Town, and Cape Town is known globally as one of the most beautiful cities to ever visit. You know, and so when you come through as a tourist in Cape Town, it looks because it's 
it's a city within a mountain with lots of nature around it, right? So aesthetically, it looks really great, but the stories behind it and the trauma behind it is really interesting um, in a sense that what the apartheid legacy has left and what it stands for and the reason why um, Black people have a complicated relationship with Cape Town is because for a very long time, we were made to feel that we do not belong because it was the place um, where the first colonizer settled, you know, in South Africa and made it their home because one of the things um, with, with, with colonization in South Africa that the colonizer settled and made this their home and um, displaced, you know, the indigenous and the black people um, who lived, um, you know, in the country. And Cape Town is, is at the epicenter of that where we are really seeing, you know, the consequences and the oppression that continues, you know, to come from this patriarchal, capitalist, neoliberal ways um, that is seen as efficiency and that is seen as development. And what does that mean? Um, Cape Town is surrounded by a lot of water. It's right by the Atlantic Ocean, and then it's right at the tip where the Atlantic and the ocean, um, the Indian Ocean meet. So the cold waters and the warm waters meet uh, at, at Cape Point. And so water is a really interesting, you know, force in Cape Town. But those who are marginalized do not get to enjoy, um, you know, the land. And for a very long time, us not feeling like we belonged. Um, I remember when a friend of mine took a, a job at University of Cape Town and I said, how you are going to really suffer in Cape Town? And he said, you know, at the end of the day, we are still part of the land. And so we should go back and, and live in it like it's, it's, it's a part of us. I don't like the, the, the use of ownership, like my land, if it's not relational. So I say my land when, as, as, as the same way as I say my sister. And so um, when you do, and then I moved to Cape Town in 2019. And then when you do live in Cape Town, you realize the consequences of this legacy of apartheid, of capitalism, in terms of how it displaces um, you know, the, the most marginalized, where do they live? The class issues are so rife. And so when it rains, we have issues with flooding because the drainage system, uh, for example, in what we call the townships where mostly the black people live is not good. And so people are displaced during the storms, people are displaced because of the rising temperatures, people have no access to water. Um, um, last year we had a crisis where the seals were dying because people don't have food. So they have to fish, right? And so there's a, so there's a whole idea that the people were overfishing and that meant the seals did not have enough food. And anywhere you'd walk around the coast and you'd come across a dead seal uh, because there was no balance, there's no balance. And, and for me, this is what the poem was all about, was trying to capture. Uh, when will we feel, feel safe again? But also there's this clarion call that we need to go back. We need to go back to, um, you know, what our ancestors knew about how we should live with the land. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for that, Malibu. That's so interesting to learn all that, like, complex history. It's so rich, you know, and I think there's always these layers of um, complexities when, in all of our lands, I'm, I'm sure, with all these like historical forces coming in and shifting things and then having us in our new generation sort of trying to find our way back. Ooh, so it's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Yvonne, do you, would you like to share? Can you share with us a, a bit more about the, your piece? Yes, uh, yes, Kathy. So, um, I'm just interested by how our conversations are kind of threaded together by, by coast as a physical landscape and also in some sense, we are speaking about it metaphorically, uh, metaphysically. Um, I loved how Malebo spoke about uh, meditation and, and the heron coming in and how it uh, helped her choose her poem. And the story about seals, I mean, before I just speak about the poem, is very interesting. We have the same uh, similar story here between humpback dolphins and artisanal fisher folk along the coast of uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, which is where Chennai is in. Uh, where, you know, 50 years ago, even in some parts still, dolphins and fisher folk have a friendship. So dolphins find fish, fisher folk go behind them, or dolphins go behind fisher folk. They have a kind of understanding, you know, unspoken. But that is changing into conflict because of 
mechanized fishing depleting um, waters and dolphins coming and tearing the nets of artisanal fisher folk to get the fish and fisher folk and some sometimes killing dolphins um in, you know that that uh, changing of relationships I, I thought it echoed with what you said about seals um you know the, the backstory behind the poem i wrote is uh, you know echoes so much with you know what Katie shared about marshall islands um about, about south africa there's this uh thing um we can call discriminatory development you know where a port is sited you know you want to build a commercial port uh how how do you choose the place to build a port uh, if you look at chennai the history of chennai uh it, it was a city colonized by the british and before the british came chennai the south of it all the privileged lived you know the upper caste and so on and north of it the fisher folk lived other indigenous communities lived and so the british came in and the first you know harbors the red category industries the pharmaceutical industries you know which which kind of spew out poison they put it in the north not because that was suitable because the people lacked political voice uh and and, and you could prod over them in that sense you know with, with what power you had and that continues till date in governance systems you know in a kind of an internal you know colonization if, if uh, you know that were so so this this port with which adani is building is sited again in north chennai it's a bad place to build a port uh, the ocean is rough um, it is chennai's largest flood basin if if it were to rain it buffers the maximum impa- impact mangrove forest they actually buffer storms every year we face two to three cyclones and that place actually buffers it and then he, you place a port there not because it's going to do anybody any good but because you can walk over uh, people um so so that so that's part of the back story but then so, something which is arising um is is to see landscape as contiguous and the voices which have you know spoken against and and are fighting for uh, this place are, are not just from there but from a lot of other places and and uh, that's that's welcoming um, you know, to see yes i i'm really struck by how much colonialism is like playing this role in all of our stories um i think that that's what you were just saying about you know building places choosing places where people are voiceless that's exactly what happened with the marshall islands um with the us selecting our islands to test over 60 nuclear weapons here you know and a lot of people aren't aware of that nuclear legacy but that's what really informs our climate um are kind of are sort of like planning for climate threat in future too is this nuclear legacy from our past i mean over 60 nuclear weapons and they said oh we're going to choose this place where it's it's remote but it's like remote from who we were all right here so it's definitely um there's definitely some form of of course some of that's it's all rooted in in that kind of history and, and that, that complexity um Okay, so I, I did want to ask about uh, a little bit more about um, what do you think are the biggest opportunities or openings for art and cultural work in climate action? I mean, look, we're we're talking about some pretty big issues here. You know, we're we're really pointing out these issues that are are so complicated. And um, you know, for a lot of I don't know about you both, but I've been told a lot of my life, like poetry for what, you know, what, what does that do for us? Um, it wasn't until I performed at the United Nations um, with the, at the climate summit opening that people started to be like, okay, you, oh, all right, I guess you could do that. But, you know, I think there's still such a, it's still such, so seen as, as not necessarily that uh, valuable. We're always sort of the cherry on top. They'll invite us at the beginning to do a poem maybe, and then they'll sort of be like, okay, now, we're going to do the real climate work. So I want to hear your perspectives on 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 art and um, culture work as uh, as a part of this climate action. Malibo, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Thank you. That's that's really um, 
I, I like what you say about how most of the time when an artist is um, asked to represent, it's usually for either entertainment's sake or, you know, to break the ice. And, um, and I think for me, what's at the core of my work, I am in academia and I have a really, I have a complicated relationship with capitalism and existing in this world and how sometimes we have to navigate our bodies, you know, through these violent systems. And so in academia, I mean, in, in South Africa, our institutions are still, um, ex like they're still Western institutions and they still follow Western frameworks, right? And so the way that we do research and the way that we think about the world um, often anthropologizes the people that we're trying to um, work or you know with, and and we always say this university is a microcosm of society. But then, if the university continues to perpetuate, then what's the point? So, as an artist who works within the university space and interdisciplinary work, where I work across different disciplines, um, access is at the heart of my work. Like, can we take what we are doing and the research? And if we are working with communities, what does that mean, right? And what does that mean when you're doing field work that's not exploitative? What does it mean when you are researching a phenomenon and the community has access to it? Because usually we are so exclusionary in the way that we talk about issues, even as far as the issue of climate change. I mean, it, it, it ends up being a scientific conversation, right? And, um, and, and, I've, and I've seen, often seen in South Africa, climate the conversations around climate change are not prioritized um, by the government. And, um, and you could say, you know, it's not top of mind because of the inequality that exists here. I mean, we have one of the highest Gini coefficients in the world. The inequality is talking, it's glaring. And so when people are fighting for survival, um, the intersection of, um, you know, the environment and my survival, the, the, the line is becomes extremely blurred there. And so you find that people say, I am struggling for food. Why must I worry about the environment when I'm barely trying to make it? And so art plays such an important role um, in bringing the message home, you know, in speaking. You know, they always say sometimes poetry, music is the, is the language that words cannot, or it's the language that the soul comprehends, right? That words cannot reach. And so when you have artists coming together or artists then addressing these critical issues in an accessible manner, you, you, you allow people to be part of the conversation, right? You are not excluding them. And I think of uh, during apartheid, uh, when you went into the communities, it was the artists, the musicians, the plays that brought the message home. And this is why banning books was such a huge practice during apartheid. So if you wrote a book and it, even if it was fiction and it addressed an issue and um, you know, uh, books were banned because of that, because why you are, you are bringing knowledge you know, to the communities and mus musicians, they had to go to exile, right? Miriam Makeba had to leave um, the country to go to the US and also spoke uh, in front of the UN um, as an artist talking about the pl plight of South Africa and because of this, the world understood what is going on in South Africa and the pressure was put onto the apartheid government. So this is the same way that we as artists today, when we talk about these critical issues and showing those intersections between, you know, the oppression and what capitalism continues to do to explo exploit human, to exploit natural resources and to just plummage the environment. So for me, that is the role of art it is bigger than we can think. Um, the other day, Ben Okri wrote an article about how writers should start talking about, you know, climate change. And I think um, I'm so proud to be part of this conversation because the work is been done, you know, the work is happening. And I think with the seeding process, you get more people involved and just reflecting on their role as an artist in terms of talking about this. Yeah. Thank you, Mala. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think there's, it's heart work, you know, I think for me that that kind of the heart needs this, this, we need it to sort of keep our motivation. Like, I, I think I really agree with you, especially about academia, like the ivory towers and how inaccessible that kind of world can be. And I'm also working on getting my PhD too, but it's very much for, um, for having to, it's very much kind of in line with like having to survive in this kind of day and age of of um of 
uh, I don't know, like kind of sharpening our tools and, and our, our, our analytical skills, you know, and I think um, for me, I, I also know it's there's only one PhD holder in our entire country and, and it's my mom still. And so it's like very much a completely inaccessible world for our people. But on the other side of it, you know, we have our nonprofit, you know, that work that we, that we do during climate and heart health arts seminars and, um, you know, like health art camps and, and plays. And I think you're totally right. They, they, they are so much more effective in, in getting these messages across and getting people to engage. Um, what are your thoughts, Yvonne? Do you want to add something to, to what Malebo shared? Yeah. You know, you know, I'm struck by what you said about survival um, and, and environmentalism. In, in some places, you, you find that both seem to be the same. Uh, because your your survival, your identity is kind of inseparable from the land, water, you know, creatures. In other places, it's it's not so. You know, the the, the story of that is is difficult. Um, in fact, presently, um, I'm fighting a, a, a you know court of law case for a large wetland called Kaliveli here, which uh, two large commercial fishing harbors are proposed by four powerful villages there. Though 60 other villages are dependent in the inland waters, four sea-facing villages want the harbors. All of them indigenous people as such in the, in the, in the you know, right sense of the word. But within that also you see, you know, caste and layers. You see inequalities and and. You see inequalities within inequalities and, and, and that complexity just shuts you. You don't know what to do. And it's it's a battle I did not want to take, um, but, but one has to, to, to say, hey, you know, the wetland needs to be saved um, in, in that sense. So, I mean, that, that just stood out for me. And, uh, you know, matter of culture, I think, you know, what we call crisis and climate, springs from cultural values we hold and what is passed on to us as a good life, a meaningful life, the criteria for that, what matters, what does not. Um, you know, when I talk about uh, education, you know, the, I often quote from this essay called The Commercialization of uh, Childhood by Alan Kanna. She talks about, I mean, it's uh, she, she's an American uh, psychologist. Um, she talks about how by age 12, children can name about uh, 300 brands. Uh, and I have seen in in my practice in with children, um, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to work with hundreds of children almost every week. And when, when, instead of brands, it's let's say 50 species of trees or 100 species of trees, local trees. It's a cultural shift because when you name something, you, you see it every day. There's a possibility of a relationship, conversation, noticing, and, and, and a place uh, concretely in your imagination. And so when, when there's something happening, you know, somebody plans or, or, or just the perception of landscape is different. So I think that's a cultural value. Um, a, a, a very quick story about art. I'm not an artist. I have the an artistic capacity of a peanut or something. I mean, I, I don't draw as such, but I mean, I, I write poetry. Um, but we were, you know, a, a campaign not so long ago uh, for Vedandangal. My essay for um, uh, Harvest Moon was on this place, a beautiful place where birds and farmers had a centuries old friendship because the birds, when they put their guano inside the water, it would fertilize the paddy fields. And so uh, we were fighting for it. There was a pharmaceutical company who wanted the sanctuary to be reduced 60% and everything. Uh, what I did, and uh, I mean, a whole lot of other people kind of joined in, is uh, I, I had access to children, and children can't fight. You know, you know, campaigns in the way. Of course, we are seeing powerful ways of that happening in different places. Ask them to make art, and so that kind of spread out. And then we had a press conference where we had about two hundred pieces of art of children across Tamil Nadu. The press came in and they were zapped. 
and it, they had a way of writing about the whole thing which made the government take back the denotification proposal so i, I, I witnessed that um you know the power of art in in moving people Oh, that's amazing. That's so cool. I love that the kids were involved in it and that, you know, it was their art that ended up shutting it down. I think, we you know, we need more stories like that of um, the power that, you know, it can, it can, it can create. And, but I, you know, I also think like just as much as these like really powerful movements, like when is now, it feels like a quiet project, you know, of connecting and, and build relationship building. And yet it's still just as valuable too. So it's really cool to just sort of see all of that, but I, I'm amazed at your at that you guys were able to to do that and that the youth were involved. That's so important. Um, so I guess thinking about uh, so there's um a theme. This I like this question um, for the theme for this conference is uh, locally led adaptation action. And, you know, adaptation is something that for us in the Marshalls is like a huge thing that we're really focused on right now. You know, um, I'm just learning now about like hard adaptation solutions, like building seawalls, building up islands versus like nature based solutions, like planting trees along the coastlines and how that can protect, you know, more rural islands. But that, you know, at some point we have to do these really like extreme solutions of building islands because because the world's not changing fast enough. So adaptation is kind of this new terminology that I'm just grappling with now. And um, I guess the a question to consider is how can we link climate adaptation with cultural work? Um, you know, right now we're teaching what the national adaptation plan is, and we are um, uh, like what how how this plan fits into our world because this is basically what we're calling our survival plan. And a component of a survival plan includes a community consultation, which is really our like biggest. Um, our biggest national led consultation on climate change we've ever had. Where we're going to all these different islands, we're gonna cover all these different groups and our nonprofit is, is covering youth specifically. So it'll be youth going out to other youth and using art to actually engage youth on, and get their perspectives on what kinds of adaptation pathways they wanna consider. You know, these hard solutions, these nature-based solutions, the changes they wanna to see to their islands. Um, and, you know, we're going to be looking at this art and then using that as data. And I think that was something that I never really considered before is like art could be data. You know, art is data. It, it's just as much information. So I wanted to know, do you have any, you know, I, I don't know why I didn't like think of it like that, you know, but first, I guess I'm so used to these boxes. So I wanted to know, yeah, um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you guys have any ideas of how that, you know, that might look in your world or, or any examples or, or ideas for the future? Alebo, do you want to go share first? Yeah, um, thank you, Yuvan. Thank you, Kathy, for the stories. I, one of the things that, you know, um, I appreciate is when you hear stories um, from the communities because that's so important and that's data, right? Um, but when we think about how we think of data in our institutions and how we can then think of data when we are leading these solutions is, is really important. So I have a thought um, and it's something that I, I, I keep thinking about and I had a chat with my mom this morning about it um, in terms of you know, the accessibility of language and how when we name something something, a whole group of people think they are not a part of it especially you know, in, in our country where English is the medium, but English still excludes a lot of people because you know, um, even though we have 11 official languages, you know, our mode of communication is English. And that is also, we still have a lot of people that do not speak um, English and then they call them illiterate because they cannot express themselves in English. Uh, but we don't think about, you know, um, in terms of their grassroots um, ways of being, and you know how they can explain things in the way that they do things. So, uh, so I was talking to my mom about how growing up there were certain practices that my grandmother and my great grandmother had, right? And we didn't understand what they were um, in terms of if it started raining and it would flood. Um, um, you know, she would gather with the other women in the communities, and I was like, yeah, you know, five years, six years old. 
um, t up to 10, like when you, when you start thinking about if they knew that the rain, you know, would come and there was no weather forecast telling them that the rain is coming, they would just be like, on Saturday, it's going to rain. Um, and they would gather together um, with other women um, and they would, they would like build certain kind of nests to protect the crops um, uh, and, and they would gather the chickens together in a way to protect them, you know, um, and, and just like sustainable methods in the homes in terms of, um, you know, how they thought about plastic, right? It only hit me later, like, this was marvelous. This was genius. Like, um, our grandparents, we, you know, just because science has, or the, the text, the West, the West has said plastic is bad, uh, we think they have introduced that to us, but our great great grandparents knew about the impact of plastic, you know, on the environment already then, and the kind of just like solutions or the or the ways of being that was available then, um, and and thinking now about even now in today's context, you know, in in grassroots areas where we find, um, you know, because climate change will affect the most vulnerable. And in South Africa and everywhere, it's women, it's children, right? And so it's it's always interesting to see that women whose voices are not heard and who's not who are not known and who are not in front of the media are constantly thinking of ways, right? How to adapt and how to protect, um, you know, where they stay. So I was just thinking about a story about um, a group of women in the Eastern Cape um, who have been, I mean. You know, when you when you go along the south coast of um, KwaZulu Natal, which is a province, right into um, the Eastern Cape, they've really been affected by floods and where they were placed, right where they were placed. And so, when it rains, um, there's a lot of soil erosion that happens, and so a lot of them are displaced. And so, it's it, so at the moment they are gathering themselves into small communities and finding ways um, that they can grow their own food. Um, finding ways of, because um, uh, they were like, okay, if it rains a lot, the chickens get killed, so maybe let's get ducks. You know, just like listening to these stories and they are not in front of the media, no one is reporting them. And uh, because of that, they usually get discarded. And I'm always interested about when we do um, local adaptation. Um, when I come from the, the you know, the IV, IV tow ivory towers of the university, I think I have the knowledge because I do research and it's scientific and I'm going to go into these communities and I'm going to tell them how can we, you know, um, sustain or protect or, you know, adapt. Um, but, um, but now I'm more of, okay, let me have conversation. Let's go into the communities, not as um, not coming and saying, oh, I'm from Joburg, I'm from Cape Town, and I'm from UCT, and I'm doing my doctorate. And so that means I'm here to bring solutions. And it's just like, let's have conversations, right? Share with us your PhD wisdom that's not awarded by the Western institution, but, you know, that's awarded for, you, for your wisdom of being here um, on this land. So th those are just my thoughts. They're not coherent, but um, when you were speaking and you were just sharing the stories, I was just thinking about my great grandmothers and um, yeah, just the women that inspire me um, at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Malibu. I mean, that really makes me think about um, some feedback we've gotten is that, you know, there's so many outer islands that we have to go to to get their perspectives. You know, they're called outer islands, but they're really like neighboring atolls from the main urban centers. And, um, you know, a lot of times there's been tension that, you know, we've been getting feedback that they're tired. They're tired of giving, um, you know, feedback into these plans, into these studies that um, our national government is constantly doing and they don't see anything come of it, you know, and they don't understand the context or why, you know, where, where it's supposed to go. So I think that's super important. Oh, I think we might have, might have lost Malibu for a second. Um, but uh, maybe she'll come back on and uh, there might have been connection issues, hopefully. But Yvonne, maybe can you share a little bit then about what, what your thoughts are on that? On locally led adaptation solutions and kind of in, how cultural work can play, can support locally led adaptation? The word adaptation is, as, as you described for yourself, is, is very new to me. I, uh, 
I don't think I, I used the word once in 10 days or something like that, or, or even that. Um, but what it made me think about uh, is related to what Malebo was saying about solutions is, uh, you know, if I think about some of the adaptation solutions implemented, they are false solutions and they have their agendas. And it, it links back to, you know, you're speaking about consultation and how the, the process of consultation is, there's, a, there's the facilitator and then there's the subject and, and, and then the direction of the dialogue. All of that goes into what emerges as action, which will be adaptation or whatever. I'll give you an example. Um, in 2004, uh, I don't know. Marshall Islands is in which ocean? I'm sorry, I'm uh, is oh, fine. Um, it's in the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so did you face a tsunami in 2004? Any uh, little bit? Uh, so it usually hits the other islands. Actually, the okay. first uh, tsunamis start from the Marshall Islands and then okay. they end up in other places. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So we had a, a very bad tsunami in 2004. And then it, it devastated a lot of, uh, you know, coastal communities, right from Sri Lanka up till, you know, it was felt, I think, even up to Lorisa, you know, uh, much north. And what happened was the paper industry rode on this. Uh, coastal sand dunes, you know, perhaps you have that, uh, you know, ecosystem in, in your place, is, you know, there are these sand mounds which, you know, wind and grass dune binders create over you know, 800,000 years, which can be destroyed in two hours by, a, you know, excavator. Uh, you know, there were places where the, the fisher folk were living on the dune crests, other, other communities, and the tsunami, the tidal waves kept coming in, and the sand kept drawing in the ocean infinitely. You know, that was, uh, you know, something different people said. When the tsunami came, the paper industry rode on to it and say, hey, you know what? We want to protect the coast. Let's plant casuarina trees. And they went on a massive planting of casuarina trees. It was knee-jerk for the government at that time as well. And what they did was they destroyed the sand dunes. So for sand dunes to be built, you need dune binders. You know, spinifex grass. It was, it was in the poem I read. Uh, you know, uh, foxtail grass, fimbri stylus. These kind of slowly, they are the architects of dunes. And when these trees come there, Casuarina also is not native to this place, they completely destroyed that. So an existing, uh, what do you call, mitigation structure, natural, went off. And, and so this whole thing about adaptation is something to be uh, skeptical about. Um, th th that was my thought. No, I, I, I totally agree. Um, that's actually something that we've kept in mind throughout the process of developing our plan is that we're really, um, we're very thoughtful about developing it in the sense that we want to make sure it's our, it's our people that's directing it, um, the plans and then de and doing the solutions. That's why the community consultation is such a key part is because we're actually getting feedback from people first before we implement you know, whatever adaptation solution we're, we're considering. So I agree. It's like a completely new kind of science that's out there. And a lot of times it's a terminology that applies to old knowledge. Um, and, and these kinds of false solutions are, are so, um, yeah, they can be so damaging and it's hard to navigate because we're like, we're just trying to survive. And yet we're getting flooded with like, you know, feedback from, from outsiders, from World Bank, from consultants telling us this is what you should do. And a lot of times we're like, no, that that actually doesn't work for us. So it's really all about like, we're not only trying to survive, but we're also trying to figure out what's the best way to survive. And, you know, what's the way that takes our community and our cultures into consideration and honors the knowledge that already exists there. So I totally agree. We don't have sand dunes at all. So I kind of want to like see what these look like because it's it, that sounds like another world. But um, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, so I, I think we only have a few minutes left, but, um, uh, maybe do we want to, uh, Padma, should we, oh, there's my label. Okay, great. Oh, you're back on. Okay, good. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so I, I lost connection because my laptop lost connection. So I'm on my phone now. I don't know what happened. Okay. 
All good. Um, well, yeah. I think um, I wanted to invite the audience to use the Q&A or chat box if there's uh, any questions or comments that people would like to share. Um, yeah. Uh, so I want to, so if there's any questions or comments that people would like to share or anything, then the chat box, please put it into the chat box. Um, otherwise, um, I did have some like specific questions for you both, but I'm sort of cognizant of the times. So I want to ask Padma. Um, oh, if no questions. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, maybe we could jump in. Oh, uh, Padma, do you want to answer, ask a question for us since I've been the one leading most of the questions? If you have a question you'd like to share with us. Um, great, thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> I, I, I'm enjoying listening to this powerful conversation so far. The exchange is so meaningful and I'm really moved to hear about how art is not just a tool, it's also information in itself and how it also can mobilize people and galvanize forces. Um, <clears throat> you find Sorry, Kathy, you mentioned you had specific questions for Malebo and Yuvan. Would you like to go ahead with those, actually? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. I just wasn't sure we had the time, but um, okay. So uh, we do have until we have 15 more minutes. So um, <clears throat> seeing oh, okay, as there good. are no questions yet from the audience, I think it would be great to hear more from each of you. And Kathy, thank you for all the sharing that you're doing in between the questions as well. It's really enriching. Thanks. Please go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So the first question I have is from Malibu. And it's um basically I, I, I've read in your background about being a, you know, you've written a lot about gender and you and a feminist and feminism, or I'm not even sure if I'm using that uh that correctly. But um, I know that you've worked a lot about those intersections. You've written about feminism, African feminism. Um, and I guess I wanted to see, uh, you know, could you share your thoughts on how gender injustice intersects with the climate crisis? I think that's something I get asked all the time and I never know specifically how to answer. I, I have different answers, but it always feels like people ask me like, you're a woman, what does this do? tell us your opinion on this and I'm always like that's not actually I'm not um I don't study you know gender issues and, I, and I'm not an expert on gender policy at all and you know but it's just because I'm a woman I'm, I'm only speaking from lived experience but not to say that lived experience isn't valuable in and of itself but I am curious you know as somebody who's worked in it yeah I mean um I also get asked that question a lot um so I speak from an African feminist lens um, in the sense that I have to qualify it with African because um, you know, when you think about Western feminism and even black feminism from the US sometimes excludes ex experiences um, of feminists in, in Africa, for example. So um, in my book, yes, I do write about feminism, but it's experimental writing where I use storytelling to, to talk about African feminism and social constructivism as theories and, and what theory looks like as an experience. So when you say you speak from experiences, that's exactly what I do in terms of how do we merge um, these theories or frameworks to our experiences and how can we then, when we think about decolonization of knowledge, how do we think um, not differently, because when we say differently, it means there's a set way of thinking and then you, how do we think, you know, the way that we've always thought and, or, or how do we go back to the ways that have always been excluded, right? So when I, when I, when I think about um, climate action, climate change, it is an African feminist issue um, because um, as African feminists, you know, the whole thing is talking about liberation. It's not just about equality, right? It's, it's, it, it goes further than that. It, it looks at the issues that, um, you know, those who have been oppressed on the continent and everywhere else um, continue to face. And so it's about liberation for all humans and liberation for all sentient beings. And you cannot remove one from the other. I think you mentioned this earlier that, oh no, 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 it was Yuvan who mentioned this earlier that you know, it's so important for us to show the intersections of our survival and the environment that they're actually not so different that if you're fighting for yourself, 
you should be fighting for the environment or you could see how if the environment is under threat that your whole being is under threat, right? And so uh, when you think of inequality, when you think of oppression, um, those who suffer the most are women, right? Women, children, um, you know, uh, uh, um, queer people, those are the most vulnerable when it comes to patri patriarchy, capitalism, um, what, uh, what's, what's currently under threat, the exploitation of natural resources, the exploitation of humans. And so, um, and then when you, like I was speaking earlier, when you go into these grassroots situations, it's mostly women who are seeing the effects of, you know, who are mostly affected, um, you know, by the climate crisis, who, and who are thinking about how to avert, right? Um, who, are, who are gathering. Um, uh, and, I, and, I, and I never like to talk about the most obvious organizations or the corporates that like to carry the messages, but I always like to talk about the organizing that's happening behind, you know, behind the scenes where we don't see how a small little town or how a small little place, and we say small little according to who, but how that place um, you know, is, 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 is just going on fine and finding ways, um, you know, to protect themselves, to protect the environment. So, so the connection there is about understanding who is mostly affected, who is always doing the action, and um, how then do we, how then do we then um, use these gender and racial and, um, you know, all these lenses to think about um, um, climate change, yeah. I mean, Thank I could you. go on and on and on and on, but because of time, I'll just like, <laughs> I could go on and talk about the epistemologies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure, yeah. And the pedagogies, so but I don't want to go there. <laughs> no, I yeah. agree. There's so much there. I mean, there's so much to, to consider there. And I, I was just thinking like, man, I really need to sit and kind of, I love your um, African feminism. I think I've been really heavily, you know, I'm sure you can tell from my accent from my time growing up in the U.S. I'm heavily influenced by the U.S. politics and by U.S. Yeah. Uh, feminism, but that really doesn't, you know, since moving back here and living here for a while in the Marshalls, I'm like, this really doesn't have much of a place here all the time. And so I'm, I'm very careful about when when to bring in that feminism, pers feminist yeah. perspective into this space yeah. and when to sort of you know, take a step back and realize it's it's more nuanced than than what yeah. you know what it might look like to me as someone who's still learning about my my culture and my island. So yeah, I totally I love that you know you you know and I think that's something to really grapple with a little bit more. Um, but yeah, um, okay. So my final question to Yvonne. Um, so we've been talking a lot about you know I think me and Malibu have been talking a little bit about you know these ivory towers and these ac these academic kind of spaces, but I know from your background that you've you've been engaging as 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 a teacher and as an activist and you've kind of look you're trying to reshape what education looks like, which I think is is so powerful and so necessary as as more child centric. Um, I, I was wondering if you can maybe share a little bit on a little bit more on your, your thoughts on that and how, especially in the context of the climate crisis, you know, how do we re-envision re education for ourselves and for our community when, as me and Malibu have both been acknowledging, this, these institutions perpetuate, you know, um, these ongoing histories of, and hierarchies and, of, of colonialism and, and trauma and power. Yeah, yeah. When you bring in the question of um, um, education and learning, um, I, I use the word learning in a very uh, you know um, cautious sense because who decides what is learning, what is meaningful learning, what is not, uh, is a you know a, a contested area. Um, you know, there's um, one needs to look inward a bit uh, and and explore. Uh, the realm of how you know the crisis of environment can be a manifestation of of you know inner pathologies you know within the human condition um one thing we know for instance uh you know looking at children looking at, at ourselves other people is that if you look at somebody who's violent or, or somebody who's a bully you know uh, very clearly that somebody in the house 
you know, the, one of their parents or somebody is also violent or, or they, um, something in the home environment is creating um, a threat or, 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 you know, physical or psych psychological unsafety. And that translates and that translates. So I, I have, for instance, uh, I've seen uh, in some children um, who, who, who are difficult and, and who uh, show, you know, very little empathy and they can be aggressive and violent when they're very small. A dad who has been violent, their dad, you know, having created that same thing. And then it's kind of passed on. And um, some, something which comes to mind is, uh, you know, right now, um, it's turtle season in Chennai. Uh, so Olive Ridley turtles, what they do is they're born on a beach. And then for, and they have something called natal homing, which means they come back to that same beach where they're born to again, uh, you know, make their nest. So that, that goes on for generations. And we actually don't know if the beach is eroded or there's a, a structure built there. What do, what do the turtles do? Because their sense of coming back home is so strong. And, and I think that sense is there in all of us. Um, going back to that, what the, the physical, the emotional, the, the, the oh. psychological landscape that is home and trying to recreate it, replicate it. So whatever was felt, whether it was violence, whether it was safety, a sense of recreating that for our children and, and that, that sense of homing. So I'm, I'm seeing that kind of intersect with the, the climate crisis, a, a kind of an unhealed streak, uh, no, not a streak, no, streaks, getting passed on and, and also beautifully in different places, people finding how to interrupt that for themselves and, and, and repurpose trauma and suffering into, into, into some, you know, compost it into something like fertile soil. Um, so I think you know, childhood is really the crux of, you know, culture as, as we are speaking about, because that's really the most formative part of the human being, where beliefs, values, um, go deep in not 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 just psychologically but cellularly you know what is experienced shapes the nervous system um yeah th those are those are the lines I, I see crossing with you know climate crisis learning childhood and and, and the intersection at which i work Oh yeah, I love that. That's so powerful. Um, and I also I just I I, I will always dig a good composting metaphor. <laughs> so yeah, I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, those are so such interesting ways to sort of think about it. And I think there's so much room for for exploring those kinds of connections. Um, I think Malibo's connection <laughs> fell off again. Um, but I think uh, we're about to kind of close out. And um, I, I guess I, I wanted to see if there's any further offerings before we um, before we close the session. What legacies of violence would, must we tend to? How can we compost them into? Yeah, I think that's a really um, yeah. And I think poetry can do that. Poetry can call attention. It it calls attention to the wound. And I think that's what's so powerful about poetry. It it points out the wound and and doesn't let us stray from it. No. Yeah. Wow, Kathy, um, I love that poetry leads us to the woods or keeps us attending to the wounds. And this has been an amazing conversation. We all learned so much from you, Kathy, and Yuvan, and Malebo. Thank you so much, Malebo. So glad you could make it back still. <laughs> yeah. And really happy your connection behaved while it was you speaking. <laughs> so we didn't miss anything you said. Um, Kathy, thank you so much for leading that conversation um, and drawing out really strong responses. And I've been asked to share three takeaways before we close um, this session. And this is what I picked up from the three of you. So one is that there are specific lands, waters, and communities and experiences that one cannot know without directly relating with them. So the importance of relationality. And 
um, aside from poetry or art pointing us to the wounds, they can also show us ways we can better understand other people and places. And poetry and art can create the feeling of interconnectedness that I believe will help us help each other through the climate crisis. I mean, so many people are talking about how we need to stand in solidarity with each other, but it seems like something that's so hard to grasp. How do we actually do that? And arts and culture have a pivotal role in doing that. That's my second takeaway. And in shaping conversations on climate change, um, all three of you have spoken of how there is a heart and soul to our experiences of the crisis that art or poetry can embody and also convey. And so art is, is, is it itself information and data. I love that. And although art is considered marginal to the real climate work and negotiations, it is one of the most effective ways of connecting people, increasing involvement, and galvanizing action. And finally, it was so good to hear from you, Malebo, about how When Is Now is, as a cultural and arts campaign, celebra celebrates plurality in cultures and communities and shows, as Kathy said, how we can quietly and powerfully listen and respond to each other's experiences. So I want to share that When Is Now is going to continue through 2022 and the campaign will be active all the way up to COP27, supporting CVF's agendas on loss and damage through culture, arts, and public mobilization. So this is a open invitation to everyone that's here listening today to be part of When Is Now. Join our global web of poetry and murals and music and performance. Um, visit whenisnow.org to see how you can participate and stay tuned um, by following Agam Agenda on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And again, thank you so much, Kathy and Yuvan and Malebo for all that you shared this afternoon. Plenty food for thought that we're all going to be digesting for weeks to come, I think, and as we go forward in our work for climate action. Thank you, everyone.